anticipation runs high, <laughs> but only among the hosts. And, and spirits the are low. Yes. <laughs> Morale is low. Anticipation is high. Frustration is high. And we're not even sure if it's working. The audience doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, well, I think the music is working. I hear. Do you hear that? No. Can you, you can't hear that? Oh, no. It, there it is. There it is. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, welcome to the Video Reformation Podcast. I'm Ben Oliver. I'm Justin Plant. We're the co-founders of Storyboard Media and your guides to practicing effective video for business. We're like the Lester Bangs to your William Miller in Almost Famous. Hmm. Yeah? It's a good flick. Yeah. I don't remember who each of them are, but... So, William Miller was uh, the main character. Okay, the young right? the, the, the young yeah. writer. And Lester Bangs How was... How appropriate. Philip- a writer? A writer, right? Er? Yeah. Uh, and Lester Bangs was the the senior rock journalist. That's a cool name for by, a rock journalist. I know, right? Lester Bangs. <laughs> played by Philip Seymour Hoffman. Ah. Who, you know, was kind of his guide as he was on the road. Like, do I do a puff piece on the band? Do I need to be honest? Should I be honest? Mm-hmm. All that stuff. So, you know, now that we've explained the uh, simile, uh, we can move on. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Before we jump into our topic today, which is hiring a writer, writer. a little housekeeping first. As usual, uh, please send us your topic requests. We have a nice long list. But if what we're talking about doesn't interest you, then what's the point? Uh, Keep them coming. Uh, Today, we are joined by esteemed panelist. um, (laughs) Panelist. uh, Senior contributor. To the podcast. Um, second time, right? Second time as a guest. Third episode, because his previous episode was a two-parter. Is that right? Oh, I, yeah. I believe so. Yeah. That's correct. That was a hit. Whoa, just- oh, sh- shush. How do you know who we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, do not Google Lester Bangs. Or uh, do it on a different... Do it on incognito? <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, on that note, we are thrilled to welcome our guest today, David Olson, Storyboard hey. Media's content strategist, internal creative director. Uh, All-around swell, swell guy. Good. Swell. He's probably the best dresser in the office. Uh, <clears throat> best hair in the office. That's for sure. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yep. Um, That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Well, this is a men's I- hair care podcast, <laughs> so why would we bring anybody else on? <clears throat> Um, okay. Well, I wasn't quite prepared for that, but I can shift gears pretty easily. I think. Well, okay. Yes. Yeah. I think that's part of it. Yeah. In addition to the to the best hair uh, in the office, David is also the best writer in the office. Um, he's published. Oh yeah, um, published a children's book. published a children's book. Do you want to plug that? Do you want to plug it? Um, I won't. Just to keep <laughs> <laughs> keep us on track. But I'm sure we there's a there's a title up right right about here that has at least <coughs> the a, name a buy of, link. of there's the a buy book. link. There. There's, there's a buy link. Yeah. Yeah. Any affiliate, affiliate revenue yeah. that we get um, through our links is, uh, you know, whatever. That's Disclaimer. how we eat. All right. Um, that and sponsors. And I do understand that we have a new sponsor for this episode. David actually found the sponsor and, and brought them to us for this episode. It's the okay. really the only reason we brought them on. Uh, to talk. Just so we get the um, revenue. Yeah, David, what's what's the name of, of our new sponsor this week? Uh, this week's sponsor is Beta Brain. It's a cognitive and emotional support supplement. Okay. Welcome to Beta Brain. Um, yeah, they only- reached out to me a while ago and I said I don't really have any outlet to, you know, to, to read this copy. But, um, you know, I said, it, you know, if, if something happens to come across my plate, you know, I'm happy to read this and take your money. But um, so I'm glad I'm glad you guys gave me this opportunity. Well, I'm sure they reached out to you because David Olson, of course, is an anagram for Joe Rogan. <laughs> yes. So that's probably where part but of But only the... when you're using beta brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know yet. Um, all right. Well, enough dilly dallying. Um, stick around to hear the full beta brain spot later on in the episode. Uh, on to... Uh, writing for video content. Um, why don't we start uh, for those who, who haven't listened to our 2020 trends? 
how'd those go, by the way? Oh, can't um, wait. episode. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself in the context of, you know, what kind of experience you've had in your career that that has kind of gotten you to the writer that you are today? Yeah, that's it's a long journey, but I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, like any good, we writer. have all day to do this podcast, right? Yeah. Well, so far it's taken just yes, about like that. any good writer. <laughs> So I, uh, yeah, so I started, uh, writing, I wouldn't say professionally, but seriously in college. And, uh, I was writing short stories and everything. And, and my short story professor or advisor was like, uh, you need to stop writing screenplays in my short story class. Cause I was basically just writing out like script treatments <laughs> and submitting them as short stories. And I remember her circling something being like, this is a camera movement that you wrote in a like <laughs> narrative short story. And uh, I was like, yeah, I don't know. That's just the way that's how you write. Right. Anyway. So that kind of set me down the path of uh, writing script form more specifically writing screenplays. And, and um, then I got a, an internship at Paramount pictures when I was in college. And that's when I kind of got a, a, a tutorial in what makes good script writing and specifically what makes for a successful screenplay. Based um, on some of your stories, I'd say you got a tutorial in what makes for bad script writing also. Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, you, you can certainly read bad scripts, but even like bad scripts that make it to the level of like paramount pictures, there's something about them that is working because otherwise they wouldn't even make it that far. So maybe the story is bad or, or silly or whatever, but structurally, in terms of the the formatting and and the way it's put together, it has something about it that is working. Um, and then once you get to the level of where you're giving it to readers, like w- which is what I was doing, then um, you know then it's up to the reader to determine whether or not it's actually worthy of uh, of moving on to the next level to the executives or whoever. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I took all that and I uh, went back to finish up school. And I knew at that point that I was really interested. I, I just the format of writing in scripts just made a lot of sense to me. Um, and I, I from there, I uh, had to finish school with what they call a senior capstone course. And Typically, these capstone courses for an English major are assigned to you. You don't really choose it. And um, usually you get something like Deconstructing John Donne, a deep dive into the romantic poetry of the 1890s or whatever. And it's just like a god-awful, boring three-hour course that you have to endure for your final semester of college. Mine that was assigned to me was called Stand Up and Be Counted, and there was no other information. And I just thought, okay, whatever. This is just three hours on Wednesday. I have to go to this thing called stand up and be counted. Don't know what it means. And they finally sent the the, uh, course description with the book list. And all the books were like Seinfeld, Jerry, DeGeneres, Ellen, Colbert, Stephen. And I was like, what? Like, what kind of a class is this? And the description said, stand up and be counted the role of comedy and satire in an ailing democracy. And... I was like, okay, that's a pretty cool, like, given that my buddy was doing like literally what I think I said, like the deconstructing romantic poetry or whatever. And so the class was essentially a deep dive into the history of comedy and its relationship with culture and society and, uh, and politics. And it was kind of like the daily show. How did we get from, you know, from stand up comedy in the fifties to the daily show, Lenny Bruce to John Stewart. Hmm. And so it was kind of just like this, perfect kismet uh, thing where I was like, oh, this is like my favorite class that I've ever taken. (laughs) And uh, it happens to be the last one I'm taking. And so through that, I discovered the second city because there are so many through lines from Saturday Night Live, uh, obviously Stephen Colbert. Um, Were you in Chicago at this point? Did you say that? Sorry, no, this was um, was in New Orleans. So I went to to college uh, at Tulane University in New Orleans. So I was finishing up there and in this course, you were, I was learning a lot about, um, you, you know, the history of comedy, but specifically like the second city kept coming up again and again and again. And that's what really piqued my interest. 
Um, and so after school, I, I worked as a PA on a couple film sets, uh, and we can come back to this later, but I do think that a writer should underst- have a basic fundamental understanding of what production is <laughs> and what mm-hmm. it means. Well, specifically, if you're going to be a writer, at, whether it's writing for television or film or video, um, understanding the fundamentals of production is really important, I think. And we can kind of circle back to that. But uh, so anyway, I, I worked as a PA on a couple film sets, but I, I eventually realized I wanted to move up to Chicago. I'm from the Midwest. I already had some buddies up there and that's where the second city was. And so I, I uh, headed up there after school and I spent the next six years um, in Chicago in that comedy community. Um, and I started out just taking sketch writing classes at the second city. And then that developed into taking improv classes And that developed into taking musical sketch classes and eventually just putting up your own shows. I was never like on the professional stage there, but they have these auxiliary stages. And so I would stage, write, direct, produce, perform in a bunch of shows up there. And the reason why I think that was important is because really you're writing so much so often in these short form sketch. Like every week I was just churning out sketch after sketch revise a sketch, someone would come to me and be like, hey, I really like the way you did this. Would you mind taking a look at mine and see if you can tweak it? Um, so, you know, eventually some people said, hey, can you direct our show? And then I was just taking all the performers and the sketches they were submitting and kind of rewriting them, looking for themes that you could like use that to pull out uh, a, a show that had some kind of thematic coherence to it. But again, just sort of like, just that um, constant writing and rewriting and uh, and then for something that essentially you sometimes perform once and then it's gone um, or you read it once out loud in front of a bunch of people and then they're like, yeah, eh, what didn't really work. And you're like, OK, well, that was a lot of work for for something that kind of died at the table. But it's good training because it just teaches you to just keep writing, keep going, um, keep churning out ideas and also writing for other people's voices. Um, that led me to getting a master's degree in screenwriting, which, uh, you know, I don't regret it, but, uh, (laughs) I don't know what the point of it is. Um, other than again, good training, met a lot of good people. Um, and from there I moved to Los Angeles. I was working in Los Angeles again as a script reader for a production company um, from there, I fell into a lot of article writing, blog writing, and eventually copywriting um, for uh, a marketing agency out there that um, was specifically focused in SEO. I became a team, like a copy team lead. I, I kind of forget what they even call it, but essentially I was managing a team of freelance writers, focused again more in marketing copy. But yeah, from there, once my wife and I moved to Durham, um, you know, I found storyboard media and I knew I wanted to get back into the realm of, of video production, but also just, um, script writing. Really. It's just a, a format that, again, I really love. I, I love the process of production, but also that, uh, creative process of taking a script you write and turning it over to other people who have other creative skills, whether it's your, your DP or, um, your editor and, uh, you know, creating something pretty cool out of that. So anyhow, that's how I found you guys. And, uh, you know, we've been, we've been making some cool stuff ever since that we have, I don't know if that was quite as concise as I was expecting <laughs> it to be, but, um, well, it's a pretty, that, pretty, <laughs> hopefully that was pretty comprehensive. Full experience. Yeah. Big resume there. Well, I mean, you are 63 years old, so <laughs> it takes a while to, to get through that long and esteemed a career. So, Justin, you've written down some follow-up questions. You want to jump into those? Yeah, does that right make now? sense to just go there? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you mentioned uh, being on set as a PA, um, and I guess even in live productions at Second City. Um, how does how does that experience help with writing? Do you have any examples of of how? Uh, it may not have to be an anecdote necessarily, but whatever wherever you want to go with that. So I think that's an important. That's an important piece. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, the biggest uh, uh, lesson that you learn after working on a set 
in any capacity, really, but especially if you're a PA, um, you start to see just how many people are involved in whether it's film, television, video, um, commercials, whatever, just how many people have to be involved, what, what a budget uh, gets you uh, when it comes to a production and taking that and translating that into uh, writing your script, um, I think gives you a better sense of, okay, if I'm going to write a scene that takes place outside in Manhattan at night, um, is that actually feasible? given the budget constraints that we have or the production constraints or whatever. Um, because sure, it would be great to be able to do that or to shoot on safari in Africa or whatever. It doesn't even have to be that extreme. It's just being mindful of the realities of the production from that early phase of, of pre-production and script writing. Now you can also say like, listen, we're going to brainstorm and no ideas off the table. And I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. But I think when you really get down to business and you're actually writing a script, um, you need to be aware of what those details you're putting in that script actually look like and translate into when it comes to the production, when it comes to the budget, when it comes to hiring crew, talent, et cetera. Are you saying something? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, and maybe I'm making too much of it too, but, but, but in your background, you were talking about how, you know, you were writing camera direction into your short stories. And, and to me, I think that's one of the things that, that is a, a fundamental element of writing, writing scripts is when you're writing prose, you have to verbally paint a picture, right? You have to kind of create those visuals with your words. And yet when you're writing for a script, you know that you're going to have visuals attached to that. How, how does that change what you need to put into a dialogue or a voiceover knowing that, you're going to have some kind of visual to go along with it that, that tells, you know, so much more of the story. Yeah. I, I it's, it's really important. It, it, it's why it, the visual medium and specifically video, um, or again, TV or film, uh, is what it is. I mean, you can, um, first of all, you can condense things. You can make, you know, you don't have to explain everything out loud. Um, you should be showing, you should be using the advantages that the visual medium gives you to, to show your, um, whether it's your story or whatever, you know, you want to use that as much as possible. So it can take something that is five minutes long and turn into something that is two minutes long, right? I mean, if you're, if you're, um, writing out all, every element of the narrative in voiceover, first of all, that's bad writing, but, um, you know, it's also just making it unnecessarily long. So, um, you know, you well, should be always thinking in visual. Yeah. And I, and I think, I mean, when I hear you say, take something that's five minutes and make it two, I know you're thinking of the, the exercise we had yesterday with one of our client scripts Yeah, where, where they gave us an initial pass and, you know, they've got a kind of a, a value prop sentence that, that, that lands on a colon and then has like three bullet points below it. That's written as what the, the voiceover artist is supposed to say. And this is an animated video. So why not take those three bullet points that were meant to be spoken, make them, you know, visual, whether abstract or literal bullet points in an animation while the voiceover actor just says the first sentence up to that colon, it saves you, you know, two words per second, I guess, uh, you know, on average, mm -hmm. um, that you don't have to talk through those three bullet points. And, and I think that's something that it's not necessarily wrong, but that we find so much with, with our clients. And I think that, and, and I, I just have to imagine this happens across the board because I get it, but that they're used to writing written on the page content blog posts, social posts, um, uh, you know, articles, uh, white papers, those kinds of things, things that are written for the page, not the voice. And that's one of the key things that, that, you know, that video does again with the showing and telling you, you get to take all of those descriptors and all of those. I mean, I, I wish, I don't know, I'll look for it, but 
um, there is a great statistic about how much information the brain can take in over one second with visuals versus audio. Mm-hmm. And it's like 673 times more information. It's a thousand words, Ben. <laughs> yes. A picture is worth a thousand words. That's that science. is a scientific <laughs> fact. Oh, so wait a second. If I did the math there, then a, then a moving image would be worth, I don't know, like 10,000 words or something. 1.8 million, million words per minute, I believe, is the what equivalent. Forrester. Scientific quibble, equivalence. Yes. Wow. Oh, my. Wow. That's yeah. a lot. But the actual science is in how much information the brain can process visually as opposed to auditorily. And it depends how much beta brain you've actually taken that day. <laughs> right. That that is probably. But I don't know true. for sure yet because I've I've never right. We have no idea taken it or no idea heard of it. I haven't read the copy yet either, so I I don't know either. That's always safe. Um, <laughs> um David, you said something like uh, I can't remember exactly what you're saying, but you said dot dot dot. And, but that's bad writing. What it what is good writing for the screen? What is bad writing? For the screen and uh, is there an objective measurement for that or is it uh, a personal um, taste or is or it real it? science or is it 1.8 million <laughs> or is it forester <laughs> science i mean it, it's it's certainly subjective i think what i was referring to was like if you just used vo and no um and no visual elements to uh you know to support get your message across and any economize your message yeah then that is inefficient. It's not economical at all. Yeah. Um, you're wasting people's time, frankly, unless you are deliberately yeah. creating something that is intended to be, you know, um, for visually impaired or something like that. That would be an exception. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm somewhat borrowing that from the, um, if you've seen Adaptation and there's kind of the famous scene with where uh, Charlie Kaufman goes to see, goes to the Robert McKee thing Mm -hmm. he's yelling at him like god help you if you use voiceover i've been to a robert mckee seminar by the way and he he does uh is he like that he is basically uh exactly like that guy um but he uh he does explain himself a little bit more in terms of 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 the the voiceover thing but it's basically if you're using it as a crutch Mm -hmm. um and uh i think he's right in the sense that like if you can't think of any other way you, when you have what you have with a visual medium to get your message across um, and you have to constantly depend on just on exposition and VO, um, then and that's just kind of lazy writing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you ought to be able or or it's someone who is just more suited for um, writing in in prose. Right. Um, and, and they're just maybe they don't have that. Um, ability to translate the idea into a visual medium, which is which is fine. And some people just aren't suited that way. But I think what we do, we try to do both. Um, and yeah. it, it's certainly a more engaging and, and I think a, a more effective way to communicate messages. That's interesting. <clears throat> uh, you have a lot of experience in that the narrative or the comedy, the sketch, those that type of stuff from the work that you've done. Um, but a lot of B2B video, I'm not saying all of it or that it's good or bad, but a lot of B2B video has voiceovers and is made yeah. purely with voiceover. Where is yeah. like, where's the balance or where, where, how do you decide which direction to go um, in a particular project? Well, I mean, I think you, uh, you know, like, like I think what we always try to do if we're creating a B2B video that's animated um i think we put just as much if not more attention to those visual elements and make sure that they are compelling engaging and informative right they're not just there to be interesting and catch your eye and keep you watching past the 15 second mark Mm -hmm. Um, they should be communicating the idea in another way i don't know if this is what you were asking but it's kind of what i heard in that question is When do you, you know, like, like oftentimes we'll use a host for a video. Mm -hmm. So an on camera looking into camera, speaking to the audience kind of host that, that can, 
convey a lot of the same information that a voiceover can, but there, there are benefits sometimes to being able to engage with a person visually, even if the content is the same. And so I think a lot of that has to do with the audience really Mm -hmm. Um, it's the audience and the content and, and how much they need to take away from the content. If you're doing something that's, you know, maybe more top of funnel where you want somebody to have kind of an emotional reaction, it's like, Oh, I could do my job better with that thing. Mm -hmm. That may be something where you want to put a, and it could be an animated character. It could be a live action character, but more of a host that someone aspires to be that person. Right. And so I think you could take where as a connection to in, in some way. Yes. Right. They're a proxy for the audience or they're or they're they represent somebody in the audience's life or work. Um, and they they identify that they want to be more like that character in their job than they are right now or whatever. Um, but sometimes, especially lower down in the funnel, you need to convey more specific information. And so it's less about emotional and it's more about logical Mm -hmm. at that point. And to me, it's that's where I mean, if if I kind of look at like the further down in the funnel you go, the closer you get to more VO. Wait, did that rhyme? Uh, I wasn't listening. What? Yeah, no, that's (laughs) no, I think it did rhyme. I think it did rhyme. I'm a poet and I didn't even realize it. The further down the funnel you go, the closer you get to VO. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a poet. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, you should be writing short stories. I should. I should. I'm gonna go write some short stories. Um, I think, <clears throat> but but and 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 that's just kind of a random thing that that as you were asking that question, uh, you know, I was thinking about too. And so you kind of need to. There's not necessarily a be all end all for animation with VO versus animation with host versus live action with host versus live action with VO. I I mean, you really have to look at what you're trying to, I mean, sound like I'm beating a dead horse here for anybody who listens to the podcast on a regular basis, but like, you know, what's the purpose of what you're trying to do? And is that purpose educating, entertaining somewhere Mm -hmm. in between? Do you want them to make an emotional connection or do you need them to get information? I think that goes into it a lot too. But to me, that speaks to how as a writer, you need to be prepared to do both. You need to be prepared to convey the same information in multiple, ways. in multiple different ways. Yeah. It, it also, so you said purpose, I guess that reminded me of integrated as well on the, the manifesto integrated. It has to integrate with their brand too. It has to fit that, that company's brand. Yeah. And there's choices to be made there from a strategic standpoint, but also, uh, the last one, attainability, like, do you have the time to hire actors and cast and all that? Or do you need to jump into animation to get this thing out for an event or something? Yep. Um, I guess all those things kind of help weigh in the decision making process there. Well, and that, I mean, uh, then that reminds me that, you know, there is no right or wrong. There's just interesting and less interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you're not going to fail if you decide to do a VO driven piece that you want to connect emotionally. You just may not have quite the connection with your audience. I mean, some of the most entertaining videos I've seen over the last couple of years have been VO driven. It would just B roll from dissolve. Remember? Yeah. It's just very comically written. Yeah. It's very topical. Yeah. And, And it's, and it's kind of meta too. Yeah. 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 Now, David, I think another often overlooked part about writing for video is, I mean, there's script writing, Right. There's VO writing, there's there's host writing, there's dialogue. But, you know, a lot of what what you do also is you'll take transcripts from, say, interviews on more doc style driven pieces. And you'll actually craft a script from words that other people have said. And and I don't want I I don't want to I don't want to miss the opportunity to to remind people that 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 is a form Writers, of writing also. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so so talk a little bit about what you're looking for when when you're not working with a blank page, but you're working with things that other people a have complete said set of words <laughs> and and trying to like organize them in a way so that they sound coherent or smart or make and the point you quickly. want them to make. Yes. And quickly. Not answer quickly, yeah. so, but yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's said quickly, but also answer quickly. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you're referring to <clears throat> paper edits. Yep. Um, and so essentially for, for anyone listening, what, what, you, what you're referring to is say, take an interview. You might um, interview a dozen people about um, their experience using some specific uh, uh, digital platform or something. And you want to craft out of that a message that is coherent, clear, um, and takes out all the ums and uh, the the pauses or uh, the parts of what they're talking about that don't really seem to have much direction. But I see what you did there, by the way. Yeah. Um, so zero in on the pieces that, uh, are relevant to the, the message that you're, you're trying to craft. So I think, um, it's kind of fun really to do because you're, it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. So you're taking those transcripts and you're going through looking, highlighting the, uh, sections that are relevant to, to your, um, your message. And you start to kind of move those pieces together. Now, I think it's really important here to make sure that you're not taking people's words or ideas out of context, um, both just from a kind of basic, like ethical standpoint, but also just because it won't read as, as natural or truthful. Um, if you're just sort of trying to shoehorn in something they said over here to connect to this thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not about like manipulating the things that people say and spinning that into, you know, the uh, the opposite context. It's it's really just about um, making them sound <laughs> sound uh, smart and better um, in reference to whatever that if it's a testimonial or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so but yeah, it can be it can actually be a fun exercise to sort of put those puzzle pieces together and, and work typically work closely with an editor to, uh, to make that happen. I don't recall if we talked about this explicitly um, about writing for voice as opposed to writing for the page, but kind of the other side of that coin is that when asked a question, right. And, and forced with just answering in a mm -hmm. conversational style, people rarely complete sentences. Yeah. Like if you read mm -hmm. transcripts, of people just talking off the cuff, it is virtually impossible to turn that into some kind of coherent line as if you would have written it. Yeah. Because they, they, they interrupt themselves. They, uh, trail off. They, um, all kinds of just, I'm not trying to do it on purpose here, but like this kind of like finding the words kind right. of thing. And oftentimes they don't end up finding the words, but they've said it like eight different ways that are incomplete. And so the combination of them, the interviewer is like, oh, yeah, I get you. But there's nothing to work with there. And that's I, I think that's a that's a big part of of working with those pieces, too. And, and again, kind of the other side of the like writing a script for somebody to say is different than what you would write if somebody was just going to read it yeah. off of a page. And I would I would even add on to what David was saying about you've got these three. <clears throat> or sorry, 12 transcripts and you have to make something out of that. But th it, that's not the first step that the writer is involved. Uh, right. <clears throat> ideally it's not because they've, they've been a part of designing those questions before they even got asked the pre-interviews, the pre-interviews. Yeah. Um, writer might even be on set kind of handing questions to the director or whatever. And we've had David do that. Right. Yeah. And uh, it just to, because I think a writer has to have a picture in their head of, of what the end looks like. And, and if you're putting, if you're giving the control to somebody else, you got to guide them in the right direction with the right questions. And so that's an important part for a writer to be able to, to be a part of that pre-production process. Yeah. And, and another, um, uh, another point quickly is quickly interviewer interviewees, um, often, sit down for the interview knowing that they want to communicate a few things. And so they end up repeating themselves a lot. Mm -hmm. Even if they're asked different questions, they end up. So you've got an opportunity going through the transcripts where maybe they've actually answered this question three or four different times, even if the question was different because they've just got stuck in their head. Oh, I need to talk about right. this, this and this. And so it always makes sense 
to read through the entri- entire transcript as opposed to just the answer to that one time the specific question was asked because they often just repeat themselves as they're trying to figure out what their answer is to some other semi-related mm-hmm. question. Um, David, anything to add on that before we jump into sponsor? No, other than the the example you cited where we were actually, uh, where I was involved um, with the interview itself, um, I think that can be really important to have somebody there who's, you know, when you're asking the questions, you're in the moment and you're trying to to listen and uh, make eye contact, et cetera. So having someone off to the side who's maybe the writer or, so, or another producer who can listen and start to draw connections between things that they may have said earlier and what they're talking about now and can start to form new questions on the fly can generate really interesting and compelling um, responses from your from your interview subject. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, before we jump into the sponsor, I have some really exciting news. I found the statistic to which I was referring earlier. Okay. And it's not exactly what I thought it was. Uh, the human brain processes video 60,000 times faster than text. I th- I, earlier I was talking about it. I thought the comparison was video versus audio. Mm. But I found the actual thing, and it's 60,000 times faster processing video that. than text. So. Hmm? You want to cite that? Yeah, uh, it's a picture I took at uh, Vidyard's Viewtopia ah, right. in November of 2016, the day after Election Day yeah. of 2016. <laughs> San Francisco was really happy about It was that. an interesting <laughs> place to be the day after <laughs> Election Day 2016. Um, so, yeah, not quite what I was thinking, but still a valid statistic. Um, I'd like to hear from our new sponsor, Betabrain, at this point. Mm-hmm. David, have you received the copy yet? I have. I have not read it, but I've received it. Again, good. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I think you just can't, you can't be held liable if you didn't actually read it ahead of time. Huh. Yeah. Thank you. That's kind of what I was implying, but I'm <laughs> glad you said it explicitly. If you're a fan of Joe Rogan, Gary Vee, or UFC welterweight fighter Donald Cowboy Cerrone, you've probably heard them aggressively champion the undisputed benefits of Alpha Brain the number one brain enhancement supplement in the world. If you're not a fan of those guys, Beta Brain might be more your speed. Beta Brain is the first nootropic created specifically for betas, featuring a patented formula designed to keep your sense of self-worth humming at a moderate to low level. Beta Brain ensures you maintain the healthy fear of letting other people down and the insatiable desire to please that you need to stay motivated throughout the day. With BetaBrain, you can say goodbye to sudden bursts of energy coupled with self-aggrandizing fantasies. And hello to keeping your thoughts to yourself as you sit quietly in the least comfortable chair in the room. Because you just probably don't deserve the good chair. Plus, BetaBrain's unique combination of anxiety-inducing vitamins and testosterone-smothering nutrients all but guarantees you'll spend the deepest hours of the night replaying that awkward banter you had with the FedEx driver earlier that morning. Try BetaBrain for free today. Or I... I, I don't know. If you don't want to try it, that's cool. If you do, that's fine. I don't care. Whatever. Beta Brain by Off It. Off It. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so, David, have you tried the product yourself? I have. I didn't read the copy. I had no idea what it was, but they did send me a bottle and I, uh, I tried it. Um, and I'm sitting in a pretty uncomfortable chair right now. So. I was going to say, yeah, don't you have some nice couches around, like some real puffy chairs? I've got great couches. We've yeah. got great chairs, great couches, really comfortable stuff. This is hard as a rock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, th- those those couches are uh, for you. Now, um, yeah, you may I think not- someone put a thumbtack in this one. <laughs> you may not know the answer to this, um, but my... Uh, my five-year-old son is getting really cocky and is kind of pushing me around. Is it pos- mm-hmm. like? Is it okay for kids? I'm gonna say yes, <laughs> for sure. Good. Good. Yeah, that sounds right. He's starting to frighten me. Um, yeah. Or yeah. yeah, I would just say put some of this in his yogurt. And, yeah. Uh, or take see it what yourself, happens. and then you won't care. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. But I would start with the child. Yeah, I would experiment I, I, on the child. Yeah, 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 definitely. I'm yeah. Gonna. Uh, any side effects that we need to be aware of? Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Good. And we'll, um, we'll let definitely. the listeners find that 
um, somewhere on the web? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. You can ask your son how he feels. After okay. You, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Just call. You, yeah, if anyone's yeah. wondering, just call me. Again, let's experiment on the child. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll look look uh, look forward to that report next week. Okay. So, why don't we talk a little bit now? I feel like we've talked about some writing, just as at large, facts, I guess, in general. Right? We've kind of, we've kind of set uh, a foundation for writing for video. Let, let's talk a little bit about hiring. What should somebody look for when hiring a writer for their videos? Well, I, I noted here, you should probably skip Craigslist. Um, Why is that? And uh, this comes from sort of my experience uh, living in Los Angeles. But if you go on Craigslist and you look for a writer, um, you're going to find a lot of people uh, who are uh, promoting themselves as writers um, who you know, or they're looking for writers uh, and they can't pay money, but they do have a friend's house in Malibu that we, they can borrow for a couple days. Um, but uh, the reason why you want to avoid that is because um, you, you really want to make sure that the person has legitimate uh, experience. There's a lot of people out there who like the idea of being a writer um, who will put in their Instagram handles, like Tony, the writer, and uh, they they like notebooks and pens and things, but they don't really know what to do when it comes to writing whether a script. So just be wary of that, that there's a lot of people out there who will claim to be writers who are not actually writers. Um, so stick to the more professional hiring sites. Um, we've used Upwork, Communo, Uncompany, uh, LinkedIn. So, um, you know, check those credentials. Uh, similarly, like we always say, if you're going to hire your nephew to shoot your video, um, you might want to think twice about that. If you're going to hire your nephew to write your video scripts, you know, maybe think twice about that one too, or just have your nephew write and direct the whole thing. What uh, if you're, what if what your happens. nephew got a master's in screenwriting? <laughs> Ooh, uh, then Still definitely don't, don't hire him don't do it. because he's really thirsty. <laughs> got uh, all that. Student debt to pay off. Yeah. Yeah. The next thing I was going to point out, though, is like um, there's a lot of people who are, like, we kind of touched on this earlier, but there's a lot of people who are really good at, um, like, like to reference my background, writing SEO marketing copy. Um, and that is a very different kind of writing than script writing. Um, so I'm not saying they can't overlap. I, I have done both, but um, don't necessarily assume that because somebody says that they're a good writer, you know, they can write blog posts or um, white papers that they in necessarily are going to be um, a good fit for writing your, your video copy. What might you look for in a non, uh, someone who doesn't have any experience writing for video, but, but has a lot of writing experience? What, what tells you that they're a good writer and they'd probably adapt well to video? That's a good question. Um, I think that um, you could look for someone who has writing samples from a variety of um, like different medium, but also industries, um, because that can indicate that someone is good at adapting their writing style, their voice mm -hmm. for um, a lot of different applications. So someone who has maybe experience writing in healthcare, but also education or technology or something. Um, and that their samples are obviously theirs and original and they're not pulling from somewhere else, which also be aware of that. But um, um, assuming that they're, they are their own writing samples that, yeah, if they have um, different industries they've written for um, different types of companies, um, they are successfully adopting the voice of those different companies. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Then I think that just sort of indicates this person knows how to, um, how to think in a way where they could be good. Even if they haven't written a lot of scripts, they might really be um, take to this pretty well. You know, I, I think that's, that's dead on. 
Um, it reminds me we've been looking at some graphic designer um, portfolios and resumes lately, and and when you see a a, a broad number of <coughs> industries or or different clients, and you can see that they were adaptable to each of those different ones just gives you a lot of confidence that they can adapt to whatever you're going to throw at them, even if they haven't done something exactly like, uh, you know, like you're going to want. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. This is not meant to sound like uh, uh, dismissive or anything, but sometimes people are, you can read someone's sample and be like, Oh, they, they're really not a very good Writer. I mean, just from the basic construction of their of their paragraphs, you know, their sentences, the language that they use. Um, so sometimes it's easy to weed out um, a lot of people uh, pretty pretty quickly. Um, but uh, when you get down to that, let's say you have a hundred applications. That's a lot, but let's just a hundred, and you get down to ten. And you're like, okay, these ten people are legitimately. They're really, they're really solid writers. It starts to get a go from less objective to more subjective at that point, I guess. You know, I, I find, I find myself identifying good writing on in film or TV so often reminds me of, and Mrs. Gushman will be proud. Um, but the six years of Latin that I took in middle school and high school, um, one or two of those years, we we spent a lot of time, you know, in on oratory and rhetoric. And and so those things like, um, you know, rhetorical devices like alliteration groups of three, there's a, a pacing and a structure yeah, yeah. to writing that that that, you know, really well paced writing, not like quickly paced, but like, you know, just paced where the pauses are there and 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 the. The punchlines are at the right time. I mean, so much of that, it's 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 hard to it's hard to identify if you don't know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. But I'm so drawn to those types of things. And I, I will find myself the same way. Just, you know, you, you hear a I don't even want to say a soliloquy, but like you hear like a, a, a even in just a small monologue or, mm -hmm. or somebody's answer to a question. And you're just like, God damn, that's good writing. Mm -hmm. And and so often it's just because they use those rhetorical devices well and mm -hmm. and and it's deliberate too. Right? I mean, like, like everything in film and TV is deliberate. A lot of a lot of lay people don't understand that. Like, there's not supposed to be a Starbucks cup in the Game of Thrones shot. Like mm -hmm. that was a mistake, but like Every other thing in that shot, somebody had to make a decision on what it was and where it was going to be. What color? How was this made? Oftentimes things need to get. So there are no accidents in that kind of stuff. And, and, and the writing is the same way. And a lot of it just, you know, that stuff has has worked since the ancient Greeks and it, it works for a reason. Um, uh, and those are often, you know, those are often the things that I find where it's like, damn, that was good. And then if I like go back and rewatch the line or the monologue or whatever, that's where I'm I'm hearing those rhetorical devices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. I mean, you can be self-thought. There are a lot of good natural writers out there, but studying and understanding those kinds of things can help you communicate more effectively, too. David, what were you saying? I was just going to say, yeah, if, especially if you're looking at um, creative samples, which, which, you know, we, um, we are lucky enough to do a lot of interesting creative work. It's not, um, um, you know, sometimes you think like B2B video, it, it's that not necessarily that it's not fun and creative. We absolutely get to put together some really interesting stuff. And, and with creative samples too, when you can identify a good writer, by um, you can hear their voice in what they write. Um, you know, you can you can pretty clearly see like, oh, this person has a point of view, um, especially if they're writing stuff that's more personal. Um, you know, and sometimes that can be a good uh, a way to identify someone like, okay, this person is clearly they're going to think a little bit outside the box. They're going to bring a perspective into our brainstorming that is going to be totally different than the way that um, the three of us or whoever's around the table is going to think about the thing. So um, that's another thing to look for really is like, does this person have an interesting perspective, even in the writing, the writing itself is good. And it, you know, it, it's, um, it's 
written correctly and formatted well and all that stuff, but do you hear a, a unique voice in the writing? Um, and so that's another way you can absolutely identify someone who you want to bring on board to a project. What else we got? What else would you look for in, in hiring a writer? Um, personality. And when I say personality, what I mean is, um, is a part of, you know, part of the mark of a professional writer is that person's ability to not take things personally, to accept feedback, to be open to criticism. Um, you know, that, that, that's one huge separator of someone who is a professional writer and a, a person with an Instagram handle that says Tony the writer. Um, and so I think that can be really huge. Um, you know, someone who's not going to get overly defensive about saying, you know what, the client really wasn't feeling this part. Um, and being able to say, okay, I understand. Um, now that isn't to say you shouldn't, you don't necessarily want someone to fight for things when you know that they're, um, worth fighting for, but consistently pushing back, getting upset when you when you receive criticism or feedback, you know, that, that's just, um, not somebody that you want in a room. That's not somebody you want involved on a project. It's just going to slow things down <laughs> and, uh, make things that much more difficult. So, um, someone who takes a positive attitude, again, coming from second city and something I think we adopt in our office is that yes. And approach, like you're not shutting down other people's ideas but you're building on top of them, even if it's outlandish, and even if it's not going to make it to the final stage or whatever, just that exercise of building on someone's idea instead of shutting it down can be really helpful in finding the, you know, the right idea eventually. Um, so I kind of wrap up all of those things into someone's personality. And I, I think that's just really good advice for hiring any freelancer or creative. Yeah. There's a lot of people who will be overly precious about something that they write. Um, and, you know, so I think it's important to break people of that a little bit and, and just understand that it's just, it's, it's part of the process that you have to be willing to let go of certain things. And, and you know what, for that writer, again, a professional writer will know, okay, well, I'm going to take that and save it and put it in my back pocket for the next project. All right. Is there anything else we should discuss about writing for video or hiring a writer? I can't think of anything else. David, what did you want to discuss that you, that we didn't get to? Um, I think that's it. Also my startup just, just got full and my quick time player just stopped. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, Let's hope that saved. It appears it did. Okay. Um, so I don't know if I'm recording on my end anymore. Well, I'd like to thank David for joining us today. Um, his startup disc is full. And yeah. well, I guess we can still have this uh, crappy audio of him on over the phone. So David, if you, if you want to, you know what, David? Just don't say anything. Although I do think we need to hear the sponsor. It would be nice to hear the sponsor spot again. If you're a fan of Joe Rogan, Gary V, or UFC welterweight fighter Donald Cowboy Cerrone, you've probably heard them aggressively champion the undisputed benefits of Alpha Brain, the number one brain enhancement supplement in the world. If you're not a fan of those guys, Beta Brain might be more your speed. Beta Brain is the first nootropic created specifically for betas. Featuring a patented formula designed to keep your sense of self-worth humming at a moderate to low level, Beta Brain ensures you maintain the healthy fear of letting other people down and the insatiable desire to please that you need to stay motivated throughout the day. Try Beta Brain for free today. Or I, I, I don't know. If you don't want to try it, that's cool. If you do, that's fine. I don't care. Whatever. Beta Brain by Often. All right. Well, um, I'd like to thank David for joining us today. Like. Subscribe, rate, those things, Stitcher, iTunes. If you're on Betabrain, I think it does it for you. Just actually, if you're on Betabrain, like, subscribe, and download bitch. now, bitch. Yeah, that has been this episode of the Video we Reformation do, uh, podcast. Hiring a writer. 
Brought to you by Beta Brain. Um, yeah, thanks. See you next time.